Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining our EDGEPRO Summer Series Part 3. We uh, look forward to having you all here tonight as uh, our third part in a series of great conversations with Dr. Charles Maupin, Dr. Craig Anderson, and Dr. Jacob Butler around the value of laser-assisted endodontics, specifically with the Edge Pro technology, Erbium Chromium YSGG. Tonight, we're going to focus in on predictable outcomes in challenging cases. So we've heard a little bit about the why, uh, in terms of why we look to incorporate laser-assisted endodontics into the field of, of uh, endodontics. We talked a little bit about the how in specifics around mastering some technique and um, extending applications with, with Edge Pro. Um, and we've gotten specific on some of those techniques and certainly we wanna continue to answer any questions around that. So tonight, um, you know, each of our panelists will focus in on some unique cases that they'd like to showcase um, that maybe delivered an exciting or predictable outcome, uh, maybe that they otherwise might not have expected, even though each of us here does, does great work in addition to all of you uh, online here tonight, uh, but we're uh, pleasantly surprised by um, certainly what they found um, either during the case or as a result of, of looking at the outcome um, uh, post-procedure. So um, we're going to, uh, we'll start the presentation. Each of our panelists will, will go through some cases. Um, we would ask that if you have questions pertaining to any of these cases, um, let's do, uh, let's ask those questions after, after each panelist presents so that we can uh, remember um, those questions with regards to those specific cases. I know sometimes that can be a little hard to do at the end of the presentation. And then at the end of the presentation, if there are more uh, additional questions um, that we need to ask, um, I know we've got a great um, audience of both users of the Edge Pro technology, either just gotten started or kind of uh, are, are midway into their experience, if you will, with the technology. And then we have some others that are interested in the technology and are, and are seeking more information and, and really um, trying to better understand the capability of incorporating a technology like Edge Pro. So we want to make sure that this is uh, um, valuable for, for both of these audiences. And, and a lot of that can be achieved through some of the questions that are asked. So we really do urge uh, questions throughout uh, uh, evenings, uh, this evening's presentation. We welcome you. I'm now going to pass it over to Dr. Craig Anderson, who's going to uh, kick us off here. Thanks so much, Dr. Anderson. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us here at the end of a, another week. Um, I'm going to present tonight uh, five cases, all of which, um, uh, you know, nothing necessarily special about them, but they each kind of highlight maybe a different reason why I think the, the laser can bring value uh, and, and how maybe I had some questions last time about the general wave and how I decide and, and maybe touch on that just a little bit. Uh, so I'll present five cases that, that kind of outline some of that. And then I also have another case at the end that we'll do a little compare and contrast with some general wave stuff uh, as people were asking questions last time. OK, so um, we'll let's see here. We'll start here um, with our with a case one. Uh, this is uh, this is a case this uh, uh, number 12 here, deep, deep composite filling. Um, this tooth presented necrotic with symptomatic apical periodontitis. You can see uh, periapical radiolucency. The, the 2D imaging doesn't look uh, really uh, very interesting. You wouldn't know that much was going on. But when you take a look at the cone beam, you can see just a little bit on the, um, on the cone beam slice here. Maybe something weird is happening through the mid root. Um, when we look at the um, axial slice, you can see it's a really interesting anatomy. It's kind of a somewhat of a C-shaped canal. We've got two um, two small buccal canals, little little connection here. Just a very delicate root form. So this is a case where you know I, I know that I want to keep things really small. I know that there, there could be challenging uh, areas where the where going too big could become problematic either for strip perforations or instrument separation. But at the same time, I want to do this case in one visit. I don't want to have to medicate. I don't want to have to um, feel like I can get it clean in, in one sitting without having to let the medication work. So going into this case after seeing the cone beam, I knew that um, that this was a case that I, I really felt like I needed some enhanced irrigation of some, of some um, degree. And this is what we were able to achieve. Okay, you can see we, we when you look at the uh, you know post op, you see a, a lot of it becomes kind of comes to light what's going on in the mid root of this tooth. 
um, there's actually um, not, it's not one canal splitting into three and coming back. It's two canals on the buckle and one canal on the lingual. Um, but you can see we were able to um, achieve patency. We got some nice accessory anatomy. I was able to do all this without you know, too much risk of uh, over enlarging the canals, um, but yet got nice, clearly got nice clean at the end. And when viewed from the off angle x-ray, you can see, um, you know, I finished these cases at 2004 for all canals, all, even though it looks a little bit smaller here on the, on the buckle. Uh, I, I would have not have been confident to do this in one sitting uh, with the amount of mechanical instrumentation I did to this case. Uh, the next case is is kind of just a, a case that will highlight some accessory anatomy. Uh, this was a um, tooth number 30 presented with uh, as necrotic with symptomatic apical periodontitis. This case was also completed in one visit. Um, you can see a large uh, large furcal kind of blowout radiolucency on both roots. Nothing on the um, nothing on the 2D imaging that would make you you know be too interested that anything much was going on. When we look at the 3D imaging, you can see um, through the through the distal root here, we've got um, uh, kind of a you know, two a, a separated uh, foramen here on the distal. If you look at the axial slice, you can see on the mesial, it's kind of a ribbon shaped, um, kind of a ribbon shaped uh, canal. We got you know kind of an obvious main um, lingual and buccal, but also some communication between the two. And this is what we were able to come up with. This is uh, just the straight angle x-ray. You can see, uh, you know, nice length control um, in both roots, a little bit, what looks like a little bit of accessory, you know, sealer out of a canal. But when you change the off angle, uh, you can see a lot more is going on in both roots, actually. In the distal, you can see a little bit of deep isthmus. Uh, in the mesial root, all kinds of communications between, um, between the main mesial buckle and mesial lingual. Uh, on the three on the post-op CBCT, it becomes much more clear uh, exactly how much is going on in this root. So um, again, this is a tooth. Uh, when I was doing the case, it, I was just all over the place. I kept hitting roadblocks. I irrigated uh, and and used my laser multiple times. Um, I know for sure, had I not had my uh, the laser at my disposal, I would have not felt comfortable doing this case in, in one sitting. Um, the third case uh, I did actually this week maybe or late last week. Um, this was a, a really interesting case and this is one of the cases I mentioned where where I can kind of contrast my laser experience with my general wave experience. Um, this case presented as uh, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis, symptomatic apical periodontitis. Okay, um, again, nothing about the 2G imaging is very interesting but when you look at the 3D imaging, there's something going on here on the furcal side of the mesial buccal root. You can see the, um, the main canal here, but even on the 3D imaging, it was not perfectly clear what was happening. I, I, you know, it just, I just knew it didn't look quite right. Um, when we change to the axial slice, you can see the mesial buccal root here, with two canals, palatal root here. But again, this furcal aspect of the distal buccal root um, something is going on there. So this is a case where I didn't, um, you know, if I was going to try to use gentle wave, this might be a contraindication. N not necessarily that it would cause a problem, but for me, with my risk tolerance, I would not necessarily want to use the gentle wave without knowing what this is and what some of the possible outcomes would be if I got that, um, if I ran a cycle. So I didn't. Um, I think that's one of the, the pluses of the laser is that um, I can, you know, titrate my treatment if I want to just treat uh, the mesial buckles or just treat the palate and leave the distal buckle alone. I can do that. Okay, so that's what I chose to do here. I actually ended up running when I got inside the canal. There was not a big, a big, big defect. There was no bleeding, uh, so I did end up using the laser not only on chamber mode but into the canal without any problems. Um, but I wouldn't have felt comfortable doing that with gentle wave. Okay. And this is what we, you know, came up with, you know, nothing, nothing really exciting about this post-op image. Uh, but when you look in a little closer, you can see not only did we get some nice uh, anatomy on the Powell root, but something is going on in, uh, on the wall of this uh, distal buccal root. I, I don't exactly know what um, patient's aware that I'm not exactly sure what's happening, but we cleaned into it. We've got sealer in it and we've given the tooth a chance and I was able to do it comfortably for the patient. 
without any concerns on my part that uh, I might cause any you know unexpected damage. Uh, the fourth uh, case is another uh, unusual anatomy case. Uh, this case uh, presented as uh, necrotic with symptomatic apical periodontitis. Okay, um, cone beam shows maybe a little more extensive damage here uh, and a lingual positioning of the root. All right. Again, similar to the other case, the distal roots got this kind of C-shapeish. Um, uh, anatomy to it. You can see one really broad uh, distal canal. If you look at the slice over to the to the right of the screen, uh, you can see uh, that it, 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 while it may start off as one, it, it goes to two at some point down the canal. So I knew going in this was going to be a very challenging case to to clean into some of these you know deep isthmus areas and not wanting to over enlarge my canal because if you look here, uh, the invagination on the um, Furcal side of the distal wall really doesn't leave a lot of room for air for over enlarging the canal. So I wanted to keep things as small as possible. And this is what we came up with. Okay. Unlike the case I showed earlier where I was able to navigate, you know, more fully with with you know true you know canals and make make you know more paths down. This one I wasn't as able to do that, but um, I was able to get um, lots of pick up lots of accessory anatomy in that distal root. Uh, and I was able to complete that in one sitting. Um, the last case I'm going to show here is a, is a case with uh, severely calcified canals. All right, tooth number um, tooth number 30 here uh, presented as necrotic, uh, asymptomatic apical periodontitis. You can see, uh, you know, very standard, you know, lower molar anatomy, uh, lesion on the mesial root. Uh, very faint uh, canal uh, present on the 2D imaging. If you look at the bite wing, especially, you can see just really kind of a block of block of dent in there. Okay. Um, but after lots and lots of um, long long visit, tons of hand files, multiple rounds of of um, using the laser, I'd get down a little bit. I would peck and peck and peck and make my way, you know, enlarge a little bit, run the laser, run the chamber. I'm not sure that. I had to have the laser to to achieve the the unblocking of the dentin and make my way to the end, but it, I do feel like it it helped and and made the treatment go made a difficult case manageable or or uh, at least uh, help expedite the process. Okay, um, so you can see you know a little bit a little bit over over enlarged by you know kind of what I like to do because we were doing some searching for canals up here in the top but um, in the end we were able to keep a nice conservative shape to the bottom and we were able to get obviously get very nice patency on a, on a difficult case. Um, this is the other case I mentioned this is actually a general wave case Chris Chris may not want me to show a general wave case but I think it, it will make for a nice comparison because what I get asked a lot is, you know, how do I pick which which modality I want to use, general wave versus versus edge? And what's interesting is you you can never you can never do the same tooth twice, right? You can't you you can't do it once with general wave and then once with laser and see which one you like. But I just so happened to do this case, uh, and in the very next case, literally was this case. And if you look at these teeth, they're almost identical, right? You've got crowns on them, you've got very calcified canals, and you've got a lesion on the mesial root. Um, this one actually has lesions on both, but in 2D, they, they look like the same tooth. So this is probably the closest I've ever been able to come to doing the same tooth twice, and, I, and it happened back to back. So I thought I was really excited. So I did one with laser and one with general wave. Um, and you can see the results are very similar, right? Um, this is the general wave result. Uh, very similar, and look at the top, you, you know, kind of the same troughing patterns, a little bit bigger shape at the top, and then very delicate anatomy at the bottom with some nice patency. Um, if you were to compare these two teeth, um, you know, again, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty darn close. Um, you can see that the result is basically the same, you know, and I think that's, um, I think that's what all clinicians are trying to do. We're trying to compare technologies and see which ones work best. And 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 um, I know that's those are questions I get asked a lot. And I think I think there's this maybe this idea out there that that gentle wave cleans better, right? Um, I think it cleans great, um, but I, I think the jury's probably still out on whether either of these technologies clean better. I think the reason I'm showing this is to is to kind of definitively make the point that they both work great, and that there's no reason to think that laser is some 
some technology that's um, you know in, uh, is is not as good as uh, as the general way. So I just thought that was a nice compare and contrast. So that's all I've got. Uh, I'd love to take any questions. If anybody has anything uh, about any of these specific cases, I'll be happy to scroll back to the case uh, in question and we can maybe uh, highlight some of the, the answers that are needed. Great. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Great variety of cases. And yeah, we really do appreciate you showing the uh, the differences uh, between technologies. And, and that's what this is all about, is to show um, you know how it's uh, how they can certainly demonstrate comparable outcomes, which is great here. And um, and you know for you to have that experience uh, is is uh, really uh, it's very helpful. Um, there was there are a couple of questions. Number one, on case two, you mentioned several roadblocks throughout the case where the laser helped you. Can you speak in a little more detail about how you use the laser to to address those roadblocks? So this case, I think this is the one in question. Um, yeah. This case is actually a little older. This is maybe six months ago, something like that. Um, and I'm still, I'm still in my learning curve with laser for sure. But this, I was a little bit less versed when I did this. Um, and it, as far as my memory goes, you know, this would have been a lot of chamber mode. You know, a lot of using the, um, you know, the number three tip in the chamber. Um, just creating energy into that system. Um, you know, for even if even with my skills now, I, I don't know that because of all the roadblocks here that I was ne would necessarily be wanting to put the, you know, the the laser tip too deeply in there for fear of you know, even with my hand instruments and with my rotaries on this case, I was almost every time I would put it in, it would go a little different direction or hit something. So I was very weary of where I was putting my instruments and and uh, the risk of fracture uh, with just mechanical instrumentation. So I didn't want to do that with the, you know, certainly with where I felt like I was in my skill set with the laser. So this was mostly chamber, you know, pick, 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 you know, try rotary, get down, you know, um, go back with the laser just to kind of keep force and irrigant into the, the areas beyond where I'd cleaned so far. Great. Um, Another question here is in regards to the cases where the sealers extends into the apical ramifications, how close to the apex did you take the laser? As I mentioned last time, my general rule is I'm, I'm I like I generally try to set the stopper on the laser roughly five millimeters from the apex. That's just my general rule. So, you know, usually, you know, most cases are going to be 21 to 19, something like that. Just to, and so usually I've set that tip for 14, 15 millimeters. Uh, depending on the you know the, the size of the canal, I may go a little further, um, but roughly uh, you know four to five six millimeters from the apex. Great. In terms of treating these cases in one visit with the laser, can you discuss if there are any post-op complications, pain or swelling? Cer certainly no complications that I have you know noted. Um, as I mentioned last time, my whole not the whole thing, but one of the you know, reasons I explored this was to try to transition to a one visit and, you know, practice both with general wave and laser. And um, had, that came with a lot of fear. I was a two visit guy for over 10 years uh, and, and in my general dentist years. And so that came with a lot of, of fear. Um, and at first, I think I gave credit to the technology as to why I wasn't having more problems with one visit endo. Uh, I'm not sure that's totally true. Uh, you know, I think part of the, the one visit model is maybe not as scary as I once thought it was. Um, but no, I've not had any, I've not had any, what I would call problems. Um, I, I would say my post-op sensitivity and pain is basically the same as it was before, you know, before I went to, uh, to one visit, you know, sh short of, I, I probably am getting less flare ups now. Um, again, I don't want to give too much credit to the technology. Um, I think, I'm realizing more through through just personal experience and from mentors like Charles that um, you know I think calcium hydroxide is the culprit for a lot of the flare-ups that I see, um, and so now that I use less of it, I think I'm getting a few less flare-ups. Um, but uh, but certainly no, certainly has not gotten worse. I certainly do not get more you know uh, bad care calls or bad post-op you know things I have to deal with uh, since I've switched to one visit. Right. A couple more questions. Great cases. Do you have any cases with recalls? Have you noticed better 
and quicker healing with the laser? I have I have more recalls on general wave um, because I've been using it longer. Um, I'm my recalls are, are starting to roll in more on laser. I'll speak to both technologies. I think that's one of the big things that's touted, uh, especially by general wave, is that you, you get accelerated healing uh, on, on imaging. Um, I have not necessarily found that to be true, um, but I haven't. I, I'm not one that you know. I do re, I do a lot of recalls, but I, I'm not painstaking in my in my follow up and you know taking tons of post op CBCTs to perfectly assess the rate and the extent of healing. Um, I'm a little more pragmatic than that, so. Um, I, I can't say for sure that it's that any of the technologies have have rapidly increased my healing. No. Do you prescribe antibiotics when you treat teeth with large radiolucencies using the laser in one visit? Generally, not not unless there's not unless it's Friday afternoon. No, um, not unless there's some other factor that has me concerned that that I would that I would need to. No, not particularly. Well, these are great questions. Please keep them coming. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, transition uh, on to uh, Dr. Butler. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson, for sharing those great cases. I'm sure there will be some other questions as we go through uh, throughout the rest of the, uh, the presentation here. But uh, thank you, Dr. Butler. We'll, we'll pass it over to you now. All right, great. Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Great cases. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us again. I know this is the the third in the three-part series of this summer series from Edge Pro. So thanks for sticking with us to the end. Um, really looking forward to sharing more cases today. Um, and thanks again to Chris and we got Zach behind the scenes kind of helping us out. So I really appreciate them. Um, and also you'll get to hear from Dr. Maupin here in a few. So I won't take too long. Um, for those that were here last time, I talked a lot about um, my experience with why I incorporated Edge Pro into my practice, um, some of the concerns I had in, in starting to implement its usage, and um, kind of how my, my, my philosophy and the way I treated using Edge Pro evolved over the last, it's been about a year now, a little over a year actually, so it was last September, the beginning of September that we started utilizing Edge Pro in our practice. So today's, um, it's gonna be a little bit different, similar to uh, the cases presented by Dr. Anderson. Um, so we all we all know endo works. I mean, that's why we do what we do. That's why we do root canals for a living because endo works and it works most of the time, thankfully. Um, but there are those cases, they go through all of our practices every day that are that are iffy. We look at them and we we study the CT scan and we talk it over with the patient and we say, you know, things like, you know, this this case, it may or may not heal. There's some things we can try. Um, don't get your hopes up. Those types of things. We've all been there. Um, I want to present a few cases like that where, um, you know, it may have been a little bit more of a toss up or maybe more of a, in certain cases where I would have pushed the patient to consider, you know, maybe maybe replacing the tooth in certain instances where the edge pro has given me increased confidence to complete these cases and follow the cases and 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 um, hopefully have a better outcome as we follow these cases long term i um i listed i'm i'm not quite as active on social media as the others but i did list my um so i started an instagram page here the reason why i place this here isn't so that you'll follow and, and comment and things like that, but it's so that you can reach out with questions if they come up tomorrow or down the road. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to, and I, I know I've been there, you, you hear from a presenter and they present and, and, and then the next day you say, oh, I wish I would have asked him this, or I wish I would have asked her that. And so um, you can send me a message there and I'd be happy to help you out. Um, even if we need to you know, talk on the phone or something, I, I love, teaching what I do and and sharing the the little bit of knowledge that I've gained with others. So please reach out anytime. Um, let's see here. This is my first case here. Um, I, I entitled it large lesion. It's kind of a, this case is a little, it, it's, it's more interesting than most to me because it's my main assistant's uh, family member. 
And so um, this lady presented with this large lesion associated with this uh, upper incisor. Um, I mean, it, it's just massive. I didn't put the CT uh, image on here, but it's it's even larger than it looks here on these two dimensional images. It's actually broken through both the cortical plates on the buccal and the lingual, just huge. One that I normally wouldn't anticipate would heal with non-surgical endodontic therapy. Usually these ones, at least traditionally in my practice, these ones end up getting a root canal and then uh, apicot shortly after. Um, this one, because I know the person and um, because we have the Edge Pro laser in our practice, I uh, presented the idea that we would do the retreatment and that I would run the laser at all, all the way kind of hubbed out as far as it would go um, with water to try and kind of pump the laser energy into the large lesion out the open apex. Um, so a uh, patient agreed and we've been following the case now for a few months. Um, Let's see, this is the, the last image here I have is my eight week follow up. So I guess we're probably due for another one. It's probably been another eight weeks since then. Um, but during the during the procedure, after removing the old gutta percha, I got a little bit of separation from the lesion, but not a ton until I started using the laser. And then once the Edge Pro was activated, I just got all kinds of just just fluid and gunk and and separation out of that huge lesion, as you might expect, followed by bleeding um, from agitating the uh, the tissue that was there beyond the root. And so uh, I don't know if it's going to work. It's still too early to tell, um, but I can tell you that the patient is asymptomatic and she had been very symptomatic for a long time, uh, especially just palpation, just touching up there. She was just, she always knew it was there um it wasn't it wasn't ever like a severe pain for her but she just she always knew that it was present and within a short time I mean, we're talking a couple of weeks she said that the discomfort had gone away and so we're just kind of just leaving this one alone uh to see kind of how it responds um the idea behind uh running the edge pro beyond the end of the route is to basically just i was just trying to disrupt anything that i could uh, similar to how we do it when we do apicoectomies, where we, you know, we we curette and we scrape and we we try and disrupt everything that we can and remove everything that we can in order to um, stimulate the healing of the tissue. And so that's kind of something that I was trying to do non-surgically by incorporating the Edge Pro. Um, I did it in one visit. Um, normally, I would have uh, had I attempted this non-surgically before, I would have used. Um, probably Vitapex, calcium hydroxide of some port. Usually we use um, Vitapex. I would have um, probably recalled the patient several times and replaced it over and over and over until we started to see some bony healing. But this one I did differently. Um, patient was okay with the, uh, the, the, the experiment, for lack of a better term. And so um, I, I hope to be able to report some good findings on this over the next uh, several months and years. Um, this is case two. Uh, so this is how the patient presented to me. This tooth had already had a root canal and it had had um, apicoectomy as well. And so um, you can see from the you can see it better on the axial slice of the CBCT, but there was there was definitely evidence of probably an MB2 here, um, just kind of this lesion. You can see this bevel from the apicoectomy, so it wasn't kind of, maybe maybe wasn't resected as well as I would have liked. I didn't do the surgery, it wasn't done in our practice, so I don't know the, the, the circumstances behind it, um, but it had been done many years prior. The patient didn't even remember when. Um, the root was already short. Um, so we talked about, well, do we go back in, do another apical? The patient was really adamant about trying to save the tooth. Um, I talked to the patient about the Edge Pro. I said, um, he was a really great guy, really interested in learning about, you know, what it was that we were going to be doing differently from what had been done before a number of times on this tooth. And so I presented the option to utilize the Edge Pro to treat the tooth uh, non-surgically. And so um, tooth also had a sinus tract, as you might imagine, from that lack of the buccal cortical plate there. Um, this is the post-op x-ray over here on the right. This is the pre-op. 
So I actually, um, I treated the whole tooth, not just the mesial buccal root. We found MB2. Um, and I also treated um, MB1 and I was able to, I don't know if the, uh, I don't know if I just pushed the old uh, root canal filling that was in there, the, uh, the filling that was placed during the apicoectomy. I don't know if I just like pushed it out into the lesion or what, but I was able to get patency pretty easily. Maybe it was soft. Um, and, and so I treated uh, the entire tooth with the assistance of the Edge Pro laser. Um, I have a video that I want to show you because I also, um, so I used tip one to disinfect the root canal system here as part of the, uh, the root canal retreatment. But I switched, after we were finished, I switched to tip three and I got just kind of a quick video. I had my assistant do it with her cell phone here. So it's not the best quality and we we're kind of moving around a little bit, but I'm gonna show you how I was um, just kind of running the Edge Pro laser with tip three, just at the preset settings, no special settings or anything into the uh, sinus tract. Looks like the sinus tract after looking at it now kind of had a couple of exits. Um, and you'll also see, you'll see some sealer, maybe it was my sealer, or maybe it was, um, you know, part of what was left behind from whatever I pushed out from the previous apicolectomy, but you actually see some of that kind of coming out here once the, once the video runs. So I would just kind of insert it, fire the laser, and then just pull it out slowly, and you can just kind of, you can just kind of see, we're just kind of getting some kind of that gunk coming out, some sealer or whatever it is that's coming out. And then uh, at the very end, I just kind of turned the, the tip three sideways and just kind of ran it right over the top. I think Dr. Maupin it was, or maybe it was Dr. Anderson had mentioned that at our last meeting. So I, I tried that on this case and it seemed to work out very well. This was just like last week. So I don't have any follow-up here um, other than uh, we called the patient uh, a day or two ago uh, to check to see how he was doing. And all the symptoms had gone away. He said that that the the sinus tract the bubble on his gums had um had, it was it was gone so um i don't know if it's completely closed up it's probably a little too early to have complete closure but at least he is asymptomatic where he was symptomatic before and he feels like the uh, the sinus tract has gone down on that tooth so kind of a cool case one that i definitely wouldn't have approached with confidence had i not had the edge pro to assist me um Dr. Anderson presented a case similar to this, one with delicate canals. Uh, this one looked pretty similar to his uh, two buccal canals and a palatal canal. Um, I finished this one at a 2004. I didn't really get any crazy anatomy that I can see on here, but I was able to keep the, the shapes very conservative, um, super conservative compared to what I used to do to, I would, open things up mechanically just to be able to have confidence that I was, this tooth was also necrotic, but just to have confidence that I was uh, properly disinfecting with the irrigants. Um, so I, I, I did my kind of normal protocol and, and ran the Edge Pro uh, to about mid root, just went through the sequence and uh, the hybrid sequence, the preset settings, and um, I got a really nice result. Um, by keeping things nice and conservative and not worrying about opening things up too much and risking a strip perforation or something like that. I just have one more case. I briefly presented this last time for those of you that were here. Um, this is something that I'm just kind of starting to dabble in now and it's kind of like an internal repair of external resorption. You have to have uh, kind of the right case for this, not all not all resorptive cases are, are able to be treated um, like this kind of from the inside. But this one, I thought we would give it a try on uh, necrotic case, um, kind of just uh, ran the, the edge pro sequence. And this, um, the resorptive defect, as I mentioned before, it was just, it was full of um, just soft tissue that had overgrown into the lesion and um, just by running the Edge Pro with water, um, it just kind of just got rid of all of that. I was just using tip three in the chamber and just kind of letting it go. I just was was holding it there passively and, and running the laser with a lot of water and suctioning. And um, honestly, I've never seen a uh, resorptive defect so clean. It just, it, it, it was just, I, I wish I had the capability to, um, you know, snap a photo under the microscope. I don't have that set up just yet, but 
super clean. I felt comfortable restoring it from the inside. Um, so that's all I have as far as my cases. Um, happy to turn it back over to Chris and answer any specific questions that there might be before we turn it over to Dr. Moffin. Thank you, Dr. Butler. Great, great cases. Also, great variety and really showcasing the utility and value here. A um, couple questions. What What is your Edge Pro settings for beyond the root end? Um, I just, for the for beyond the root end, I only use water. So I use the water setting and it's just the preset. So it's tip one that I use. And maybe the others can chime in if they have another way of doing it. But I use tip one, the longer one. And I just use the water and I, I just basically push the, the, the filament as far as it'll go and then, and then run it. Uh, so pedal to the metal and, and let it run with water on the uh, water setting. So it's the, let's see, I guess it's called the hybrid sequence. And then right. the, the second That's one, so on hybrid, you've got like the, yeah, the, the conditioner, the, the chamber conditioner. And then yeah. you've got the, the second one is the water, I believe. So yes, it's the first the part of the hybrid. So you'd use that second step after preconditioning, which would be the water. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and so with mine, um, I've never, and then with the sinus tract with tip three, and I don't know if this is something that um, the edge rep Chris Bailey set up on our specifically, or if they're all set up like this, but I have in my settings, like in my custom settings, I have one that's for, um, like gingivoplasty slash sinus tract or something like that. I should have written down the exact settings. Um, if you if you don't have that on your Edge Pro and you need it, um, message me at that SIP SAP save and I can get you those exact settings, send you kind of maybe even a video of our, our kind of how you get to it, something like that. So. Yes, and we can also uh, provide you more information. We have all your contact information for all the registrants. If you have specific questions, uh, we can get those questions answered specific, uh, specific obviously to Edge Pro users that um, you know have questions on certain settings. But uh, you know, in addition to to folks that are exploring the technology uh, in more detail. Um, well, great. Let me. Uh, we have another question here. Um, what other settings to use? Uh, you might have asked. You might have addressed. So what are the settings to use in the sinus tract? Um, type, size, power, water. Yeah, so um, again, uh, just to kind of hit that again, so I use tip uh, tip three, the shorter, thicker tip, and then I use, I have a setting in mind, and I don't, I don't fool around with the settings much, I just, I have the kind of the presets, and I just run with those, they've been great for me for the past year, and so I have one, again, that's for sinus tracts, so it's, it's I mean, it's certainly high power, um, but I don't know the exact uh, hertz and wattage and all that. Charles, did you have, were you going to chime in there? I didn't want to cut you off. I'm sorry, on responding to any of that. Yeah. So the the um, standard perio settings. Anytime you're doing a perio pocket, and I consider sinus track that as well. It's 1.5 watts, 30 hertz. Um, you know, and you're going to have your water on and your air around 20 percent. So 1.5 and 30. And like uh, Jacob said. You know the number three tip you don't want to use the number one tip in there it's too delicate you'll put it in you'll, and you'll break it and then going out the root end i would do the same 1.5 and 30 um out the root end as well one last question before we uh pass on dr Moppin here dr butler what's the rationale and mechanism of your extra ridiculous use of the laser my Say, say that again, my rationale and mechanism. The rationale and mechanism is the question of your extra ridiculous use of the laser. Yeah, so uh, again, I, and I talked more about this last time, I'm, I'm definitely probably, not probably, definitely more of a clinician than an academic here. So for me, I'm trying to disrupt something that doesn't want to be disrupted uh biofilms bacteria um cystic lesions granulomas uh whatever may be uh causing disease in the periridicular tissues i'm trying to disrupt that with laser energy that's that's kind of as simple as and the extent to where my rationale goes fair did that answer the question it did okay. very simply <laughs> 
Well, great. Um, well, thank you again for um, sharing your experience, great cases thus far, and appreciate all the great work uh, that you're doing. Um, for those that have uh, additional questions, please uh, continue uh, in putting them into the, the questions uh, area on your on your screen, and we'll get those answered. We'll go ahead and move on to uh, to Dr. Maupin. Charles, are you ready? Pass it on to you. Yeah, it looks like I'm frozen. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, Maybe we can pass over the, there we go. Can you see me now? Or can you see the screen? Yep. Everything's good. Everything looks good. Good, all right. Hey, thanks Craig and thanks Jacob. You know, on the extra ridicular, um, it's something that, you know, a few of us kind of joke around on, you know, going through sinus tracts or into something like that. We call it, we term it the uh, either poor man's apico or, or lazy man's apico. And exactly what Dr. Butler said, you're just going in there just to try to disrupt it. Try to avoid going, you know, under the knife. And, uh, you know, I say it works sometimes. It doesn't, it's not successful all the time, but um, sometimes it does work. So I think there's definitely some validity to it. You know, that's what perio is doing when they're going in there uh, down the perio pockets. Um, they're trying to disrupt that granulation tissue, break that up, and get some reattachment going on. Um, but anyway, Chris, uh, thanks for the time again. And you know, the first two webinars uh, we focused on, I, I shared techniques, showed a lot of videos, um, showed how to incorporate the Edge Pro. This one's going to be a little less cognitive load, and, and mainly just what I wanted to focus on is is just how I use it to treat the quote elusive MB2. And um, And so we'll start off with this case here. This was a uh, six month recall that was actually in the office today. And so I, I chose a few cases from this week, um, kind of put them in and then a, a few other ones that I'd had, but this case was in for a six month follow-up today, treated both 13 and 14. This was the pre-op on the left, uh, post-op on the right. And you can see we have four canals treated to their full apical extent on the uh, number 14 there on the post-op image. And we look at the uh, pre-op CT, what we see on the pre-op CT, it looks like there, you know, there's definitely MB1 there, and it looks like there's probably an MB2 somewhere meets up and then um, splits apart again, um, going on there. And we took a, uh, this was the six-month follow-up CT. I didn't take a post-op uh, CT. Um, don't do that much in, unless I want to show something here, but um, occasionally we do. But you can see that we replicated the uh, pre-op anatomy present in our uh, follow-up CT there. So. Canals join, and then we got the apical split, you know, down in the apical thirds, um, filled with, you know, sealer, maybe a little uh, mixture of sealer and GP both there. This was the uh, sagittal slices pre-op and post-op, and you can see the multiple ramifications coming off on the MB root apically. This is the axial slice, and we have the pre-op on the left showing one, you know, we can see the MB there definitely, and then we see this coming off MB1, MB2 canal there uh, branching off on that. And then I want to show the follow-up. This is the DB and palatal root, same tooth, and you see complete osseous regeneration, six-month follow-up. Someone was asking on follow-ups. I've got a lot of them. Don't show much here today, but um, I've got uh, you know, a bunch of follow-ups um, utilizing the laser. I've been using it since 2018. But complete osseous regeneration, uh, palatal root going on there. Another MB2 case here, uh, tooth number three, and pre-op CT. You can see that there's two uh, MB canals there. It looks like there's a little anastomosis going on between the two in the apical portion, and then maybe a little bifurcation going on. And you see that the post-op CT, four canals treated to their apical extent. It does look like we feel something going on in the anastomosis there. This is a three-month follow-up going on here. And you can see that we have some osseous regeneration going on, uh, decrease in size of the findings. MB and, and DB roots. Again, we got the cortical plate being reestablished, and then what we see is the anatomy being replicated again as well. Filling of the, uh, the anastomoses between the two, and then continued filling of the MB2 canal to the full apical extent. The DB and palatal findings are significant. You can see that the new osseous regeneration occurring there on the DB root, and a lot of new uh, osteoid forming there, and then the palatal root also decreasing in size. So we're kind of going to go through this quick here today. Uh, MB2 here, I think I've showed this one here before, but it's basically just the steps that I 
take. Access into the tooth is basically necrotic. Uh, first image is right after access, second image running the laser, the coronal conditioning mode, and then after instrumentation running the laser third image and right before obturation. And you can see how uh, delicate the shapes were and conserve the accesses and everything was again plain to the full equal extent. Tooth number 14, this was a calcified brick. Um, accessed, found three canals, and you can see we've got a little uh, MV2 in there as well. We look at the pre-op and um, post-op CTs here. I did take a post-op on this one. Again, there's a little remnant of an MV2 there. Could not find anything, but I, it looked like it joined in and then a single canal, MV canal, um, to the canal terminus. So we've filled the main one. I did not find any MB2, you know, portal of a negotiation, did not find any of that. Um, continued to run the tip number one, the 200 micron right in the canal orifice. And then you can see we were able to backfill that canal um, retrograde and picked up little anastomosis as well. Another number 14, calcified, uh, pretty calcified tooth here. And you can see a little line coming up from off the MB1 up to the MB2. Let's look at the CTs here. This anatomy, pretty crazy anatomy going on on this one here. Even if you were to find, I did not find an MB2 on this one, but even if you were to find that MB2 on that one, it dives directly into the MB1. There's zero, almost zero chance you're going to be able to pre-curve and, and dance back into that MB2 canal here. And we've got you know, a little bifurcation off the MV1 and then that split going on. Retro field, the MV2 up and ortho grade field, the MV2 down. Tooth number 14 had some complicated anatomy going on here. When I took the CT, there was furcal bone loss going on in between there and, you know, gave this patient somewhat guarded prognosis based on the pre-op image, agreed to treat it and we treated it and we were able to um, feel some anatomy there in the frication. Did not find a, a MB2 on this one, but again, you can see through activation of the irrigant and the MB1 canal, it retrograde filled the MB2 up, made a little loop, and then orthograde filled the MB2 down um, there. And you can see based on the CT, we actually see that the pre-op on the left, the little anastomosis between the two. And when you see that, I mean, it's good luck getting back into that canal there. This is a uh, six-month follow-up image, so immediate post-op on the left, six-month follow-up on the right, showing complete regeneration in the furcation area, decreasing size on the MB and the DB uh, findings there. Another number 14 here, some anatomy present, palatal root. We've talked about patency before, but wanted to focus on the MB2. Uh, That's what we're focusing on here. Um, oftentimes, you have that just hard stop at a 14, 15, 12 millimeters, somewhere around there. And a lot of times it's because the MB2 is taking that 90 degree curve right back into the MB1 canal. So when I have that, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time activating the, the irrigant in that MB1 orifice. This case was Monday of this week. So as I kind of wrap this up, uh, tooth number 15, this was on an elderly gentleman. He had a you know, trouble staying open. Um, you know, we all have those cases there, limited opening, difficult opening. Um, you can see the immediate post-op there on the right. And this is the CT. I'm going to show you a little video. Axial slice, looking here. So we're starting at the crown and going to work down. You can see the MB1. It looks, you know, it's got the root configuration for MB2. There's the MB2. It finally shows up in the mid to apical third of it. And then it looks like it joins again going down. We're working our way back up. There it is again and it's gone as we move back up in there. And here is the coronal sections here. So you can see based on the pre-op image, we've got MB1, looks like there was an MB2 there, um, but you're gonna do a lot of you know damage to the tooth if you sit there and hunt and try to drill down and find this one. So fill the MB1 and then we uh, retrograde filled the MB2 through activation of our irrigants in the MB1 canal. Also, a few lateral lateral canals picked up palatal root and uh, long kind of real fine spindly DB root as well. So here's my approach to MB2s. I take a pre-op CVCT on every case. You go through it when you're working all the slices. You go through the sagittal, coronal, axial slices. MB2 is not present. 
good, relax, enjoy the case. That's the rarity, as everyone knows. If an MV2 is present, then I'm making my decision based on two things. Is it separate from the portal of negotiation to the portal of exit? If it is, then you know I'm gonna do my best. You know, I, I think we all know that you gotta locate that one. So do your best to locate that one. If it's not located at the first appointment, I'm closing up. I'm gonna put a little, you know, calcium hydroxide right where I was last drilled, and then I take a limited CBCT, have the patient back for a second appointment, complete the case then. Most of the time you can find it that second appointment. Now, if the MV2, based on the pre-op CT, if the MV2 joins into the MV1, I'm gonna make an attempt to locate the MV2 and minimally instrument the case. Do not excessively remove two structure in trying to, to satisfy your urge to find that you know, little canal there that joins in. If you can't locate it without iatrogenic damage to the tooth, run the tip one in the MV1 orifice and then complete the treatment as you, know, you normally would. So that's my approach to MV2s. I'll share one last case. I finished this case up. Uh, it's my three o'clock case today. And, you know, these teeth with blunderbuss apices, everyone, any endodontist will say these are hard to gain um, patency on. You know, and, and if you've heard me lecture before, you've heard me use the acronym C. What that stands for is safe, efficient, and effective. And that's what the laser is. It's safe, efficient, and effective. And you can see from the... Um, Images here, Craig talked about using the laser to kind of peck his way down and, you know, can you do it without? Yeah, you probably can, um, but it makes it more efficient. And that's what I did on this case. I'd use an eight and 10, followed by a rotary, run the laser for 30 seconds water. Eight and 10, get, you know, next time I'm further down, eight and 10, run the ro rotary, run the laser 30 seconds. Now I'm a little further, eight and 10. And I just continue that path until I achieve patency. And you can, you can see here, you know, we captured uh, five canals in there, all separate portals of exit, uh, vertical canal, everything treated to their uh, POEs. And, uh, you know, that's what I like about the utilization of the laser. You know, is it 100% um, necessary? Um, probably not. Um, I think we can achieve a lot of them, but um, honestly, you know, it's something I wouldn't want to practice without now. And, you know, when we look at all the technologies that are out now, um, one of the things that you have to do is you got to look at, you know, no one likes kind of talking about this, but you got to look at the ROI um, on your practice. And um, some of the stuff now is just so astronomically high. You got to ask yourself, hey, does that make sense? Um, now with the Edge Pro, I mean, the price point that it's at, I don't see why every endodontist doesn't have one. Um, where it's at, it's easy to use. It definitely, I mean, when you use it, you'll see the inside of the tooth. It looks cleaner, um, and that's not a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. So anyway, uh, this was a fun, you know, three-part series here. I thank Chris and Zach for uh, heading this up. And with that, I'll turn this back over to uh, you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moffin. Great case to finish on. I'm not going to let you off the hook that easy. I know the uh, intent for tonight was to focus more on really showcasing some interesting cases, and you guys did just that. So thank you for that. But uh, beyond um, your technique for breaking through the calcification with your instrumentation and then following with the laser, can you talk through on this case here specifically, again, revisit your, your actual protocol just to kind of punctuate, because I know you've covered it before, but it'd be a nice way to bookend on how you would do this case, uh, inclusive of the cleaning and disinfection phase. Yeah, yeah, so the, the first thing, necrotic case, open into the case. As soon as I access into the case, I'm using tip number three, two watts, 20 hertz for about 45 seconds to a minute, water only, water's on full blast, and I'm running that. And then I'll drop in a 10 file is what I always start with, and I'll take it as far as it goes. If it goes to, you know, all the way to length, great. Um, but in this case, it did not. So I took it to as far as it went, and then I run a rotary, one millimeter short of that 1504 rotary and then i'm in with my tip one 1.25 watts 50 hertz and water i'm just doing water it's it's very fast very efficient you can use edta if you want and that may help a little bit um, but i just grabbed the handpiece you're toggling back and forth assistance holding it filing she's holding the rotary one i run the laser hand her that handpiece back um, and so you're constantly just doing that 10 file or 8 8 10 file 1504 1.25, 50 watts, 1.25 watts, 50 hertz, water, um, 30 seconds in each canal, 
Um, and then back to your hand piece until you get patency. Great. Very helpful. A couple questions here. Um, how can a cyst and its lining be treated or resolved by use of the laser? Well, I mean, I think that depends on is it a true cyst or is it a you know pocket cyst? And if it's fully encapsulated, surgery is probably the route that you have to go. Um, but if it's not fully encapsulated, you know, if you can go in there and break it up, let the macrophages come in and, and fully, you know, complete breaking that up, then, I mean, I think some of it is theory right now, um, and we're kind of seeing what can be done. But, um, you know, I've done, again, what, what I call the uh, four man's apico, um, sinus tract up there, I'm going with some cotton pliers and you disrupt everything and it seems to heal. Um, but a lot of times we don't even know if it's a cyst or granuloma or, you know, nine times out of 10. Charles, did you use dual wavelength technique in any of these cases? How do you determine when to utilize dual wavelength? I didn't on any of these. Um, I did on a case, I had him back for a one week recall today and I didn't put it in here. Um, and I did use dual wavelength on him. It was a premolar complicated anatomy, sinus tract. He was missing, it was 29, he was missing 30, sinus tract came back out of 30. And so I treated that with dual wavelength inside and then outside as well. And soft tissue looked phenomenal today. Um, I guess I, I don't really have a, probably ideal would be do it every case. Um, but you know, I'm just kind of picking and choosing right now. The ones that seem to be a little more refractory, um, I'm doing dual wavelength. Great. Well, great. Um, well, I think that's most of the uh, questions that have come through. Um, you know, do want to take this time to thank um, the three of you, Dr. Moppin, Dr. Anderson, um, and Dr. Butler for your time. Um, really, it's been a, a great three-part series. Our intent here was to, uh, you know, have something over the summer that, you know, we could uh, engage in, um, you know, later afternoon, early evening, certainly balancing, you know, both audiences, which, you know, uh, involves folks that are, have, have, have incorporated Edge Pro into their procedure, getting started with utilizing the technology, as well as um, folks that are, are newly interested in learning more about the technology. It's a delicate balance, right? Because there's so much information and so much of what you're talking about is, is, is so helpful uh, to the existing user. They want more uh, and to the prospect, they're uh, intellectually still you know, very curious. So as we go forward, um, you know, we're gonna look to structure more of these webinars that maybe can separate uh, these audiences and allow us to go deeper um, into technique, uh, into adjunctive uses of, of Edge Pro, um, and really dive into, you know, mastering how to incorporate this technology as, as you all are, are doing here. So doing that and then also continuing to provide information to um, the newly interested um, who are seeking to, to uh, incorporate uh, this technology into their practice. But nonetheless, it's been a very successful three-part series, and, and thank you all uh, three of you for participating and sharing your wealth of knowledge and, and experience. So um, other than that, I think uh, that's it for for uh, our, our third part. And um, I wish everybody a great rest of the week and evening. And um, we'll look forward to staying in touch with you uh, in the near term. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.